It's Mark Wickersham here, and I've just come off an amazing webinar, which I've just actually recorded uh, so you can catch up with it. I was interviewing uh, a lovely accountant, uh, one of the most humble, uh, down-to-earth people you could possibly meet. He only started his accounting firm nine months ago, having been made redundant. Uh, and not only did he have the problem of being made redundant, but also two months in, we suddenly had lockdown, COVID, pandemic, the probably not the best time to start an accounting firm, but he's grown from nothing to 100K in just the first nine months. And so his name's Neil Criddle, an amazing guy, uh, and he was so open in sharing the key to success, what he's been doing over the last nine months. And so you need to watch this right through to the end because he, he just shares so many gems. You're gonna love this session. So let's go across right now to uh, the recording of a live session with Neil Criddle. I'm honored to have Neil here because uh, he, he, he's extraordinary what he's been doing. Uh, and, and I wanted to learn more uh, about the things that he's doing. And I'm sure you will do as, uh, as well. So uh, I have, I have a, some questions myself for Neil, uh, and, that, and so let me take you through those. And the first thing, Neil, that I would, uh, and welcome Neil to, to the session, uh, the first thing I'd love to know, Neil, is I know you only started relatively recently, this year in fact, and I know we'll get on to that, uh, but tell me a bit more about just you and, and, and your background before you started your firm. Sorry, there's there's a cat in my office. <laughs> out of nowhere, this typical Zoom call with, with a pet in the office. I might have to let him out in a minute. Um, yeah, apologies. Um, yeah, I I, I, um, I said to Sarah to, just to kick off a bit of lightheartedness. I said to Sarah that I wasn't going to make any jokes about Liverpool Football Club, but there was there is a tenuous link um, about Liverpool and myself, which I'll uh, I, I'll elaborate on. So uh, Ollie Watkins, who um, is the Aston Villa striker who scored the perfect hat trick. Yep. in the first half of Liverpool's 7-2 demolition uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Ollie Watkins, to go to detail. Uh, he's, uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's actually the first English player to score a hat-trick against Liverpool in 26 years. Uh, Matt Letizia in 94 was, was the last person. But even more interesting, uh, Ollie Watkins spent a year on loan at Western Supermare Football Club, which is where I'm from, which is where I am now, uh, back in 2015. So, uh, very tenuous link, but I thought I'd drop that in just to kickstart us off okay there you go that's done um okay so um yeah I, I guess kind of where i started so kind of going back to uh i guess 2002 really when i started university um I, i've always had at school i always had an interest in in business i always had an interest in in maths and i kind of you know accountancy wasn't really a thing when i was at college and when i was at school so it was kind of my first sort of foray uh, going into university and i did a I did a degree on accountancy and statistics, so kind of part mathy, part businessy. Um, there's quite a lot of good stuff in there in terms of economics as well. So it's quite a quite a rounded degree. Um, and um, I, I went after being at university. I went straight into industry. Uh, I went into credit control first of all for a local water company. Um, and, and it's at this point I'll, I'll preamble by saying I've never worked in practice before. Um, you know, but before kind of owning my business up to now. Um, never had any practice experience at all so um through through kind of working in credit control i segued into the finance team and, th and that's when i started my senior qualification um and i did that for a few years qualified in 2012 um but really th throughout my career I i've kind of gone towards more commercial finance in terms of a, a discipline so you know um kind of business partner in the business um, giving really sort of tangible management information and, and kind of drilling understanding of numbers in, into people that didn't necessarily have that sort of understanding. So my, my, my company background has been quite sort of large corporate. So I've worked for, you know, I've worked for several global companies. I've worked for Lloyds Banking Group, one of the biggest banks in the UK. I've worked for Everything Everywhere, the big, biggest telecoms provider in the UK. So, you know, big, big sort of company experience and big company background. And it came to came to a head in about 2017, 18, when I kind of, I kind of felt that I'd run my path in terms of a corporate sort of atmosphere. And I was working with stakeholders um, in a kind of a, a, kind of like a hub and spoke model. So, so we had a, a shared service in the business that I was in and we were supporting lots of smaller businesses. 
Um, and I really enjoyed working with the smaller businesses and getting some really good feedback, um, a feedback that wasn't necessarily shared through my sort of my line management and through kind of my hierarchy. Um, so it, it just kind of led me to to a kind of an idea that said, well, you know, I'm passionate about my local area. I've always have been. I've always got involved with kind of activities in the local area, in my local community. And, you know, I know lots of local small business owners just through different sort of decision around sort of 2018 that, you know, I'd, I'd form a company and I'd, I'd maybe do some kind of small work on the side and, and just kind of see, see how that kind of worked really. Um, and then in 2019, I'm just going to let the cat out. In, in 2019, um, it got to a stage where I wanted a bit, a bit of a technical refresh in terms of what I was doing in a career. And like I said, I spent sort of the previous seven or eight years in a commercial discipline and I wanted to do more of the, the transactional side of finance in a role. So um, I, I got a role being a, a financial controller for uh, a web design company in Bristol in southwest of UK. Uh, quite small, about sort of five, six million pounds turn over a year. Um, but that, that, that really gave me the, the brush up on the technical skills that kind of then facilitated kind of sort of stepping into the business and my business that I now work in. Um, unfortunately, I got made redundant from that business in January of this year, um, at which point I probably had about four or five clients um, in, in my business. Uh, and towards the end of 2019, I'd started sort of social media activity and, and kind of promotion and, and sort of marketing work, which I know we'll come on to. Um, and, and, and so, at, you know, at January, I then had a, a difficult decision to make in terms of, you know, do I go back into the job market uh, and find something else? Um, or do I continue with my business, work full time and, and basically just try to make it work? You know, I wasn't earning enough money through my business to feed the family. Um, my, my wife is a stay at home mum without an income. Um, and I had about two months worth of cash left in the bank uh, after being made redundant. So I knew I had two months to make it work. Um, and that's that's the path that I, I chose. The 14th of January, I got made redundant. And the 15th of January, I started work on personal tax returns in my business. Wow. And for the benefit of, of those who are not from the UK, you mentioned earlier, Neil, that you're, you're SEMA qualified, which probably means nothing to anyone outside the UK. But uh, in the US, for example, CPAs are qualified accountants, and it's kind of nice and simple. It's not so simple in the UK. We have different types of qualified accountants. I'm a chartered accountant, so I'm FCA. Uh, then you have certified accountants, and then you have SEMA. There's some other ones as well, weird and wonderful ones. But SEMA is a certified institute of management accountants. And, uh, and that might become important later on in the story, I'm guessing, because uh, generally speaking in the UK, someone who's a chartered accountant like myself, a lot of our trainings focus more on tax audits. And we tend to progress into, into practice. People that go on the SEMA route, Certified Institute of Management Accountants, tend to be stronger in management accountancy, commercial stuff, and usually go down the route of going into uh, industry. Uh, not always, but that's usually the route they go down. Uh, have I summed up pretty much right, Neil? Yeah, 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 I'd say that, yeah. Yeah, so you come, you come very, very much from a, a commercial background, and, uh, uh, and so that'll, that'll be interesting to see how that kind of develops. So tell us a bit, so you started, um, and it was interesting hearing that, because I, re I remember when I started my accounting firm in May 96, uh, I, I'd started to pick up a few clients myself, kind of in the evenings, just to keep me busy, and then kind of had this big debate, will I be able to make money out of starting my own practice? Because I had a handful of clients, but, but not many. Uh, and you obviously you were forced into that position, which must have been tough. So talk about uh, your 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 early days starting your accounting firm, which is only uh, as we record this today is only what uh, nine ten ten months ago. Yeah, so um, you know I've been following you, Mark, for probably um, about a year, eighteen months. So I, I kind of tuned into your webinars. I, I, I kind of I understood what you delivered in terms of you know what what how you market yourself, and that that really helped in terms of how I sort of started to market myself back in, we're talking probably September, October, 2019. Um, 
I, I already had my, my social media uh, pages uh, up and running. So it was just a question of just sort of producing uh, a bit of content, just telling people that, you know, I'm here, you know, I can, I can provide compliance and advisory services and, you know, this is what I can do. Um, at that point, I, I joined quite a few networking groups on, on Facebook. So in our local area, in, in the Bristol area, that there's quite a few sort of small business owners, um, sort of networking groups. And again, you know, people were posting in those groups saying that they were looking for, for uh, you know, new accountants or they were looking for uh, accountants, um, you know, a, a change of accountant. Um, and, you know, it was just speculative, really. Um, I, I can't really put my finger on, on really how I got my first couple of clients, but um, I, I do remember one of them was a systems migration and they wanted to go from one accountancy platform to another. Um, I'd never used either of those software platforms um, at all. I didn't, I not even heard of one of them, but um, I've always been pretty, pretty okay with tech and, and pretty okay with sort of modern technology and, and software. So um, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and um, they, you know, they, they gave me a remit of what they wanted to do. And, you know, the data was, was in an organized state and, I managed to do that. They were happy with that. And then they said, well, actually, you know, our, our current accountant couldn't, couldn't have done this and they're not very communicative. So would you like to, to take on all of our books and records? Um, and so at that point I said, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and, and really the first two or three clients were, were kind of sort of stumbled into just from that way of kind of reaching out, you're putting up your hand and say, you know, I can help or, you know, I can, I can help with a project or, you know, I can give you a bit of advice. And, and it just kind of snowballed from there, really. Okay, uh, uh, which again, thinking back to when I started, I kind of it was a it was a you just do a bit of everything when you start out. You kind of try try things, networking events, and so on. Uh, did, was uh, from what you said, you you said you did sort of join some networking groups. Would I be right in saying that much of what you were doing at the time, and I know it's kind of more the case now, which you'll go into later, but uh, was most of what you were doing through online stuff, or were you doing physical meetings? Um. A bit of a mixture, I'd say. I, I mean, that, that project that I did, the systems migration, I did meet with them. Um, you know, they, they were quite local to me. Um, that there are a couple of projects that I managed to acquire from a, a platform called Bidvine, which it's a bit like Upwork, a bit like Fiverr, where where you you kind of sort of bid for work and and you kind of you overlay what you can give to a service, and you know if you're successful, then you start working with with the client. So I, I managed to get two or three clients that way as well. Um, you know, I think from memory, a couple of those were in London and one was further up north. So, you know, for those, it was video calls. But, um, yeah, pre predominantly it was kind of sort of just online, you know, um, in my spare time, evenings and weekends, you know, taking lunch breaks from my work in central Bristol and, and having kind of prospective client meetings at Costa Coffee around the corner. So it was kind of, a, you know, moonlighting to a degree. But, um, you know, I, I was just trying to find a way, you know, I was unhappy in my job at the time. Um, you know, redundancy wasn't a surprise when it happened, albeit it happened sooner than I would have liked. But, um, you know, the company was was not going through a great time, what with Brexit. Um, so it was just a, a, a kind of a perfect storm, really, um, how it came together. Yeah. And then, of course, so you, you were made redundant on the 14th of January. And you, you said earlier that you, you knew you had enough money put aside to keep you going for two months so you 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 started doing this properly trying to get some clients and whatever enough money for two months and then of course roughly two months later then we have this pandemic kicking off in in the uk and lockdown starting so not the best time i guess to start a, a new accounting firm so how did how did um march lockdown and covid impact you what challenges did that present and, and how do you overcome those challenges um yeah, you're right in terms of the fact that, you know, I'd been going for about two months before sort of the lockdown um, hit. Um, you know, in those two months, I, I'd been quite successful. I managed to onboard another sort of seven or eight clients. So I had about, for memory, about 12, 13 clients in total. Um, and I, I, I literally just got to the stage where I was earning enough on a retainer-based income to pay the bills. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of hit that target by the end of March. And I, I was, you know, super happy with that. You know, considering I'd never really done anything like this before. Um, and then obviously lockdown here. And, you know, the first kind of thing I thought was, right, well, I'm going to lose all of those clients there. You know, they're, they're relatively small businesses. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, I, I've, fortunately, I still had the, you know, the buffer of cash in the bank. Um, and I thought, 
let's hope this all sort of dies over in the next sort of two or three months and you know maybe again go back out to the jobs market and, and see what's around um I, I, and i generally did think that um you know but after you know sitting down with those existing clients and and understanding what they were going through and then obviously as we went into april you know all of the relief schemes were announced and um, you know, all of the plans and all of the guidance was released from the government here in the UK. Um, and, and that helped these clients because they they knew that they would be OK for a while. So therefore, I knew that I was going to be OK for a while. And, you know, fortunately, I didn't I didn't lose anybody, which is really, really good. Um, but in fact, it was it was the total opposite. Um, you know, I'd, I'd made a Facebook group. And again, Mark, you know, just kind of from your learnings and your teachings and, and, and Reza as well, Reza Huda. Um, you know, both of you guys have got Facebook groups and, you know, you, you've taught us how, how they can be a great marketing tool and, and how they can be used to help other people. So my my plan in February was to create my own Facebook group. Um, it was purely really for, for local companies. I don't think anybody else would have an interest in joining. Um, and again, just through the networking groups, I said, look, you know, this is a networking group for business. That's great. But here's a specific one here for finance. Um, which, you know, I, I started in February and it, and it got a little bit of traction, but then as, as lockdown happened, all of the release schemes were announced and I, I, and I kind of found that I was advertising on my social media pages about what guidance there was and, you know, again, sort of putting up my hand to say, look, you know, I can help if you need help with anything. Um, and then people were just being, direct, you know, directed to my group, um, but by, by the networking groups and by other people that were either clients of mine or, you know, friends and family. And it just snowballed into this, this thing, this kind of this beast. Um, and, you know, I had then people contacting me that were members of my Facebook group that had kind of, kind of, I guess, the, you know, the KLT factor in terms of, you know, they, they were used to me publishing content through the group, through the group. Um, and, and, you know, they were getting to know me, albeit, you know, I didn't know them. Um, so, yeah, if anything, you know, the, the fear of losing clients quickly turned into, I've got too much work. Um, you know, there's, I've got all of these queries, I've got all of these new clients coming on board. Um, and it's, you know, primarily um, and certainly kind of the, the location and the region that I'm from you know, the majority of accountancy practices just went completely quiet throughout April and May. Um, you know, some were furloughed, uh, some some just didn't have any social media presence at all. Um, and, and people were just clamoring for information and, and, you know, they were worried about their livelihoods. They, they, they were under, trying to understand what they were entitled to, what they could get. Um, and I was just being me uh, and just you know offering that helping hand and, and yeah the, the, the kind of the numbers just increase exponentially throughout really throughout March uh, and still ongoing to be fair. Yeah I, well I get a sense of that which is why I invited you on here that your numbers are, uh, are, are growing fast but uh, I, I, you said earlier and that one of the things I, I didn't quite appreciate is that, uh, you, that you'd actually started off you started off so well in the, you said in the first two months, I, I, you managed to pick up enough work to create monthly retra- retainers to, to, to pay the bills, which is, which, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so what, when you started the practice uh, in the first couple of months, did, did you have a particular uh, passion or focus or, or, or niche? Were you looking for certain types of work or was it a bit of uh, anything? I know you came from a SEMA background, but you also mentioned, I think that, you've, that you also looked into tax as well. So what sort of work were you, were you doing and looking for? So, I mean, predominantly in the first sort of few months, it, it was mainly compliance-based work. Um, so it was things like bookkeeping, VAT returns, or sales tax returns, um, payroll, annual accounts, tax returns. So it, it was kind of the, the typical type compliance activity. Um, and, you know, certainly for the first few months, you know, I kind of went through that stage where, I didn't necessarily undersell my stuff, but I, I I was I wanted to get clients. I wanted to get that bit of a kickstart, and, and you know I, I probably did undersell a couple in the early days, which I'm I'm sure everyone does. Um, but with my background and with you know, I, I like to think I've got a, a quite a personable nature, and advisory and you know financial planning has always been something that I've I've really been passionate about, and. The, this, the kind of the sexy side of accounting, the, the stuff that I, I find has the, the much better value uh, in terms of growing businesses. And whilst kind of the, the, the kind of the strategy to get in with clients was, oh, you know, I can do compliance and I'm a bit of a nice guy on the side. It, it was it was a quick fire route into then kind of delivering advisory and, and giving them ideas of, you know, this is what your reporting could look like. This is what, you know, your budgeting could look like in the future. 
um, and then you know charging for those services as we went along so yeah to, to answer your question the first kind of three to, to four months or so it was definitely sort of more compliance based that I was I was looking for but basically in that race to to, to pay the bills um, effectively that was my strategy okay and, and I know that uh, that you mentioned about you know, your per, your personality uh, and and one thing I do know about you about you Neil is because we're, we're not too dissimilar here is I know you have a particular taste in music which is uh, obviously hard rock music so when you're meeting your clients are you meeting them with your Metallica t-shirts or do you wear a suit and tie? I'm just, just curious. I can't imagine well, you in a suit I'm, and tie somehow. I'm wearing my ghost one today, which I, I know you're a fan of that band, Mark. So, uh, yeah. it's, I mean, when I was meeting clients um, initially, but back in the winter, it was it was just a yeah, pair of jeans and a jumper. Um, I've, I've never really worn a suit for work, so I, I didn't, you know, why would I sort of make it false and, and change what I do now? Um, and then in the summer, it was it was shorts and a band shirt. It, you know, it, it was as simple as that. Um, you know, people have followed me on social media. I, I very rarely do I get like a a cold inquiry. It's normally from somebody that I've seen that's liked some of my posts in the past. They've seen some of my content or they're a member of my group. So, so they kind of know what I'm like. So for me to turn up in a suit and, and to kind of act kind of in a smarter, I guess, more professional in a stereotypical way, um, it'd be disingenuous to myself. So, no, the answer is band shirts and shorts in the summer, definitely. Okay, I, I, and I find that interesting because because it's it, people buy from people they like, uh, and and so the, I think it's important in business to to be you, let your personality come across, uh, and don't try to be somebody that you're not. Uh, you can't appeal to all people, uh, and I guess that you you appeal to people that you probably get on very well with and have a, and, and there'll be other people that would want to have, there'd be other people that would rather have an accountant with a suit and tie and they're probably not the ones for you. I think, mm. I think that's a really important point. Uh, my next question I was going to ask was actually something that uh, Brian Wright has, has, has um, beaten me to. I know you said, um, cause clearly you're into the, all the social media stuff, and I, I want to drill down to that later on it anyway. But you, I thought it was pretty cool that you started off by saying in the early days you, you you started a Facebook group, and uh, and it's something that I'll be teaching in Marketing Mondays soon. You mentioned my Facebook group, uh, which has been a big success for me. And Brian Brian says, is it difficult to create a Facebook group? Now, I know the answer to that one, but I'll, I'll let you t tell us how you built your Facebook group. How do you get it started? How do you get the momentum going? Um, the, the, the real truth of the matter is I don't really know. Um, and that's probably an answer you'll hear quite a lot during, during this session, because I, I've just kind of just done things on the fly, really. I, I mean, you know, the, the, the concept of creating a Facebook group isn't that difficult in terms of the, you know, the technicalities of it. Um, I guess as soon as I created it, I invited all of my friends, you know, my, my Facebook friends and my family. Um, and I think I've got, I've got about uh, just over a thousand friends or something on Facebook. So, you know, I, I got a bit of traffic through that way. And then, you know, I was asking them to say, look, you know, if you've got any family or friends, you know, invite them in. So try to create a bit of a snowball effect that way. Um, but it, it's, it's really periodic, um, sort of marketing through both while well, Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn, just to say, look, I've got a Facebook group. Here's the link. Come and join it. If you like it, you know, there's, there's free content, there's advice, there's support, you know, it doesn't matter if you're an individual or a sole trader or a limited company or, or, or kind of any status, um, feel free to come in and, you know, and hopefully get some good advice. And, you know, I, I did one last week. I, I did a, I did a, a post that I posted across Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and I grew, I grew the membership by about 25%, just under, I think, um, just, just through doing that one post. So, you know, doing that maybe once a month, maybe once a fortnight, I, you know, every time I do it, the numbers increase rapidly. So um, I guess in terms of strategy, that would be it in terms of trying to get more people in. But obviously you want to keep these people in. You don't want to see them join and then go because there's nothing going on. So um i guess the content and my social media posts that i was doing on my pages it was just a replication of sticking that in the group um i've recently done a cash flow forecast template that i was giving away free as a bit of a lead magnet um i, I was putting that in the facebook group and that was getting some really good traction as well um it uh, yeah it just just kind of cross cross advertising making sure that you're being as visible as you can on social media 
Um, and if you have got a lead magnet, just drop your Facebook group link in there um, and, and vice versa as well. Um, and, and that's really kind of how I've got it to grow. Yeah, and, and I, know, I know you aren't very active on social media, which will will, will continue to, to drill down on, on how you're doing things there. But linking in with the kind of the previous question I ask is, I see you on, on, on social media a lot. And, and, and from that, I kind of feel I, 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 can, I feel I know you because, um, because you wear your heavy metal T-shirts, you drink cider a lot. Um, I know you like playing on the PlayStation. You like spending time with the kids. Uh, and, and so one of, my, one of my questions is, I often hear the, 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 the objection from professionals, from accountants saying things like, oh, I don't want to get on Facebook. I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I don't want to get on there because I don't want people sit, seeing my personal stuff and, and I want to keep my business separate to my, my, my personal life. And I just wonder what, what's, what's your take on that? Because I know that you're very, you're very much, you know, this, this is me, I'm Neil Criddle uh, for the world to see. What's your take on that? Yeah, um, yeah, I've said to many people before that how I want to be treated and respected personally is, is exactly the same, you know, from a business capacity as well. Um, you know, people say you should never mix, you know, personal with uh, pleasure with business. But I, I think from, from my point of view, um, it, it is just me and you know I've got one personality and, and one persona um, I, you know I, I'm not I'm not a different person when I come to work I'm not a different person at the weekends you know I'm the same person throughout and, and I think that's that's probably something that, that's got me some of the some of the success that I've had today and, and certainly in terms of the you know the, the kind of the, the growth aspect of where I've been and where I've come from um, because people are used to accountants in a stereoty- stereotypical um, stance at being, you know, quite dry, you know, suited and booted, um, quite corporate, um, probably more reactive than proactive, um, and that that's never that's never been me, um, and I and I wanted that to come through in terms of my business pages. I, I, I mean, you know, kind of selfishly, you know, a picture of a dog um, gets quite a lot of engagement on on social media sites. So why would I not post a dog on my on my business page and try and sort of have some sort of tenuous link and, and, and make it part of part of my day. You know, if, if I've gone to see a client and there's a dog um, at home or if there's a dog in the office, take a picture of that. And, you know, the, the content of the post is what I've done with that client. And, you know, I've helped them with the systems migration or we've done some um, budgeting work or something. But the actual picture is of a dog. So I, I guess just trying to come through in, in, a, in a sort of, uh, you know, a personal way. Um, and to try and sort of just relay my personality through my social media outlets. And again, like the Facebook group, as I've done that more, I, I've had more more engagement, which has led to more likes, which has then led to more leads um, and, and you know, video content um, as well. Um, I've never been really comfortable in front of a camera ever since a kid. I, I was always the one at the back of the class doing a recital or something. I just used to hate it. Um, but in, in, in probably the last two jobs that I've had, I've had to present quite a bit in, in front of large numbers of people and senior board execs. Um, and that kind of gave me more confidence and kind of more, more of a thought that, you know, you can do this. You know, there's, everyone gets a bit nervy. Everyone gets a little bit apprehensive about, you know, public speaking or whatever else. But like you keep saying, Mark, you know, the more that you do it, the, the more natural it becomes. Um, and, and video content for, for my business has been great. Um, and, you know, uh, we'll probably come on to kind of the more tangible aspects, but, you know, the, the, the webinars that I now do, I do one or two a month, um, initially to help with lockdown, initially to help with relief schemes. Um, I was going to stop doing them now that people were going back to work and some of the relief schemes were coming to an end. But people want to come on. People want to join my panel and and, and come on them. Uh, and and you know the viewing figures are great. So I've decided to to keep them going. Yeah, I definitely want to drill down to those those topics a bit more in a bit. But I I, I loved your explanation about you know just be you, your personality. I think I said earlier that people buy from people they like, and I I love the way that it you just let that come through in in everything that you do. I'm conscious of a question from Ben that was actually going to be the next topic I was going to ask anyway. But Ben says, 
you mentioned that you quickly went from fear, fearing losing work to having too much work. How have you managed the increased work demands on you? And I know that you're, you're big into to technology and tech. So talk about some of the technology that you've really got into and automating processes and, and being efficient. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess for the first, oh, I don't know, four or five months of, of my journey, um, I was using a like a free CRM tool called HubSpot, which which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. And I basically started using it primarily because it was free. Uh, and at the time, I didn't have many clients and I didn't know exactly what system was going to be right for me. Um, and that helped me keep, keep track of my leads in terms of more of a funnel based approach in terms of, you know, making sure that I was keeping on top of you know, catch ups with meetings and, and, and emails and letters. And then from a client perspective, it was keeping me on top of deadlines and um, project work that I was involved with. So that, that was really good to kind of help me structure and kind of help me get quite organized. Um, it's a running joke at home that I'm terrible at organization to do with the house. You know, my wife does all of the admin for the house and all of the admin for the kids and the pets. I'm terrible. But with work, I'm, I'm totally the opposite. And I'm quite sort of quite strict with, with how I sort of structure my workload. So getting HubSpot on board was, was, was really good. And then it got to a stage where I needed something a bit more um, a bit more sort of technical, I guess, is, is a bit of phrase. Um, and I. I had a couple of demos of, of specific sort of accountancy CRM systems. And I, I went for a trial with a firm called Center, um, who, uh, again, relatively well known in the, in the accountancy industry. Um, they're a local business to me. They're based out of Bristol. So, uh, again, it was kind of, you know, me supporting a local business, but also Center was the right thing for me. You know, it's, it's really highly customizable and, because I didn't want to have anything too pigeonholed and too sort of, you know, uh, too sort of concrete in its kind of structure. Center was really, really good for me to kind of, I guess, sort of flourish my personality into the way that I work. Um, and it was really kind of malleable for me to do that. So that kind of coincided. And I think I probably went over to center in about a, uh, May, June time, I think it was. And that was just at the time where I was getting busier and busier and busier, but with using center, um, and then um, using all the workflows that were within Centre, and a lot of that is automated, and, and there's other things that I've, I've still not even touched with Centre that can automate it even further. I was finding that I was clawing some time back. So I was then managing to cope with additional workload because some of the manual processes that I was doing before were being now taken up by, by the software, basically doing, doing the grunt work. Um, I started using Calendly for my appointments. So again, I was getting phone calls, emails, text messages, WhatsApp, you know, all sorts of communication strategies that people were just offloading onto me, you know, social media as well, Facebook group messages, you know, personal messages, business page messages. And I was finding that I wasn't missing any, but I knew that if the volume continued, I'll, I'd be missing a potentially really, really lucrative meeting or a really lucrative appointment. So I started using Calendly probably about the same time, maybe a bit before. Um, and, you know, that, that now is, has been really good because, Canly gives you the opportunity to block out certain times and certain days of your working week. So for example, I, I block out every Monday no, no one can book an appointment with me on a Monday because that's my marketing day. And that's the day where I spend time working on the business as opposed to in it. Um, sometimes that slips clearly with, with client deadlines, but I, I try to be quite sort of steadfast with that because I've got so many ideas and I've got so many things I want to do. I, I, I afford it to myself to have that time to work on it. Um, so, so Calendly was really good from that point of view. I was funneling clients and pros prospects to that, uh, to my link. Um, and as soon as I got a word of, I want a meeting or I want to catch up, um, rather than putting that information through my CRM, which is what I was doing before, I was putting them through, um, Calendly and getting them to book a meeting. And from that point, then I would know whether to spend the time curating them as a lead or whether it was, it was basically just a, a bit of a, you know, a, a price comparison lead in, in which case that they, they probably wouldn't be the right, the, the right or the ideal client for me. So, so center from a CRM point of view, Calendly from um, basically a time management point of view with my um, appointments. And then thirdly, the, the last one that, that's got me a lot of extra time is practice ignition and proposal based software. So um, again, as most people, I was doing proposals in Microsoft Word and then I was PDFing them and then I was sending them off to clients. And because I was following 
you're in fantastic ways of, of doing proposals. I was doing three options for each with a, a variety of prices. Um, and it, it was just creating quite a lot of sort of manual work for me with the influx of clients that I was getting. So I, I've taken that methodology and I've not changed what I've done, but I've just automated the process through practice ignition. And it also acts as a payment mechanic as well. So I'm not chasing for payments. You know, my, my debtors have always been pretty good. Um, because my clients are, are like me uh, and they're sort of genuine, honest people that like to pay. So I don't deal with anybody that I get a, a sniff of, you know, or they might not pay or they might be just, you know, fishing around. Um, so practice ignition has, has really helped um, boost my time through not having to do all of those manual proposals. So the three combined, um, three bits of software combined, have really, really kind of ejected up my time to then spend on um, kind of the business really and more clients awesome um so many things i want to talk about <laughs> so this is fascinating stuff uh, one of the things i i loved that that you said is the fact that with calendly you you don't let anybody block out a book you on monday because because that's when you do your, your your marketing and and probably a bit of an in joke for pricey academy members now but uh i don't suppose you call mondays marketing mondays do you <laughs> i do yeah do you <laughs> okay I do, yeah yeah i do and that was before i joined um the, the academy e even before i had calendly i tried to block up my mondays for for marketing activity so um it was only through calendly that it actually started happening um and i also block up friday afternoons as well because you know when the kids come in from school at three o'clock sometimes i just want to switch off for the weekend and if i've not got any meetings then then you know i, I can i can just switch off friday after lunchtime and, and spend some time with the kids Awesome. I remember when I was in my accounting firm for the first two years, I knew nothing. I've made every mistake in the book. But then at the end of 98, I, I realized I had to work on the business, not in it and, and create systems and structures and marketing. And I did a similar thing. I blocked out Fridays. Fridays were no clients on a Friday. So I love the fact you do that. I think that's really important to block out time for non-client work for developing the business. Uh, let me, I, I want to come back to some of the social media stuff because I know that's amazing what you're doing, but I'm, I'm conscious of a question from Debbie that's been waiting for quite a while, which actually, is, so let's go on to a completely different, uh, different topic for, for a minute. Uh, and and I'll, I'll give you the question first, but actually I've got a kind of more broad question. She said, how did you go about asking for a high price for your services? And what I'd love to know is um, you, 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 you joined um, the Value Price Academy very soon after, after you started your practice. I, I sometimes have people say, oh, I'm not ready to join yet because I, I haven't got enough clients. So I'm, not, I'm not ready. But you, you joined fairly early on. I forget exactly when, perhaps you'll, you'll say. I, I, think, I think it was a week or two after I got made redundant because I knew at the time I couldn't really afford you. <laughs> and <laughs> right. uh, and I, I thought it, it's just an investment. It has to be an investment. And, you know, part of the two-month plan of making it work was... Is, was to join your academy and, and you know I needed all the tools that I could possibly get to help make that happen so that you know yeah, it was quite soon after about in Jan January February time okay and, and I get this I mean I get a real sense Neil that you have a, a, a proper entrepreneurial attitude because it's the same with your with with software a lot of people in their first year of starting a business will say oh I can't afford that software I can't afford that but you look at return investment your mindset is this is going to give me something back that's much greater than, than, than the cost. So anyway, the question I was going to ask was, because Debbie talked about pricing, just talk a little bit about, I mean, you're only, you're only what, 10 months into your practice. Talk, talk about your journey from a pricing point of view. What, what, how's that developed in 10 months? Uh, what are some of the key things that you, you, you've learned? What's worked for you with pricing? And going back to Debbie's question, uh, how do you go about asking for a high price for your services? Um. So, so I guess this is the this is the aspect that I'm still learning quite a lot. Um, I, I I don't think I'm anywhere near kind of mastering. I, I know, Mark, you say you know sometimes it can take years to kind of master the techniques and and, and the logic behind it, and, and that's absolutely the case for me. I think what I've tried to do very early on was to say right what what would I be happy with? Not necessarily what I should be charging, but what, what would I be happy with for the level of work that this client is going to give to me? And that's my starting point. That's my essentials package. And then I have a full package and a premium package. And I basically just say it's 150% and 175% or, or something like that in terms of those two additional tiers. 
Um, and if they, if everyone goes for the essentials package, that's okay for me because that's the amount that I'd be happy working for that client for that for that amount of work for that price. What what I what I've done over the last probably six months plus is I've raised that base. So I've decided to say right well. Six months ago, if you're a client, you came to me and you wanted service X, Y, and Z, uh, and I've got my parameters and I've got the amount of transactions and the turnover and, and the amount of people on payroll, that was what I would have charged you six months ago. This is what I'm going to charge now because I've built up a bit of a brand. I've, I've built up a bit of a following and without sounding a bit big headed, I, I can afford to be a bit picky now and a bit choosy about the sort of prices that I can, that I can command and that I can work with. And the same answer goes to those clients as the ones that had six months previous. If they can't afford me or if they want me to discount, then they're, they're not the right client for me. And, and, you know, there are other people local to me that are more sort of volume based accountancy practices that probably would do that work for cheaper. Um, but I know that they're not going to get the same level of service from them that they would from me because of, you know, they don't have my personality. They don't have my hands on approach. They don't have my advisory skill set. Um, you know, they'd make them compliant, but that's probably all they're going to get from these sorts of practices. So that was, I mean, you know, what's a high price? Uh, I guess it's subjective, isn't it? Um, depending on the client that you work with and depending on what they value in you. Um, so what I've tried to do, I, the, the common conception that I, I had at the first couple of months is what, what can this client afford to pay? That was the trap that I went into a couple of times because I definitely did undersell a couple of those early clients because I thought, well, wow, they're quite a small business. There's no way they're going to pay 400, 500 pound a month for, you know, whatever they were looking for. Um, and it only, you know, it only came to a head, you know, a couple of months after that where I tested the water a little bit and I thought, well, this client probably can't pay this amount, but I'm going to quote it anyway and see what they say. And they came back and said they're more happy with it. Um, and that gave me the confidence to just keep going down that route. Um, and that's that's pretty much what I've done. And, and not everyone goes for the essentials package. You know, I've had a couple of premiums and a couple of uh, full package wins. Um, and, you know, a couple of those were massively unexpected. Uh, and they were, they were probably the clients that I would have undersold dramatically earlier on. Uh, and I've probably got, I don't know, four or 500% the price had I have just stuck to that, that, that mantra in the early days. Wow. And, and I love the fact, because you've, you've done some extraordinary things, but I love your honesty as well that says, look, I don't have all the answers yet when it comes to pricing. I'm still learning. So, so let, what do you, what do you, when it comes to pricing, what's the thing that you know is perhaps a weakness that you have to, you have to learn more about with pricing? What's the, the key the, the focus for you? I, I think something I need to do better is to work on the pricing with the client. I think just due to workload and my busyness, you know, it's, it's still just me and my business um, doing, you know, having that discovery call, really getting on board with the client, either face to face or on the phone, go going away, doing, doing a proposal with a, a variety of options and, and different tiers of package and then giving it to them before then maybe having a catch up meeting or a, a follow up call. I think going through it with them in a, in a live setting is something I need to do much more. Um, it's, yeah, it, I, I think that's probably the biggest kind of learning experience that I've got because, you know, who knows, I probably could have attracted higher prices by taking people through it in a kind of a, um, in a kind of a sequential format rather than just saying, here's a proposal, let's review it in a week's time or something. Okay, awesome. Um, got so many questions coming in here. I'm trying to work out what, what's the best kind of theme to go because uh, some people are going back to some old questions. Um, so actually, I'm going to go we'll probably jump around a bit as the questions come in, but uh, I, that, that kind of, I want to go back to the marketing stuff because I've got a question from, from a couple of questions from Kathy, which I want to come on to, but I know also you talked to, you talk quite a bit, Neil, about how you've been doing videos and, and, and webinars uh, and, and, and you've just said that you need to get better at that pricing conversation, which I know is outside comfort zone for many people and, and you need to get better. So I love your honesty, but you've already got out of comfort zone because uh, I, I, th I think I'm right in saying you're probably very much like me. You're an introvert and, and I'm an introvert and, uh, and, and you've started doing things that scare people, which is like video and, and doing webinars. So talk about how you got into doing that. What were some of the, the challenges, the scary things, what were things that might've gone wrong and, and what are the results? What's worked for you with, with that? 
Um, yeah, so I guess kind of beginning of the year, just doing kind of sort of selfie videos, really. Um, I'm quite fortunate that I've got um, quite a lot of nice rural rural land by me that I go for a lot of walks and runs and cycle roads on. So um, it's really nice and quiet. You know, if the weather's nice, it's absolutely beautiful where I live. So just kind of going out and sort of practicing, kind of doing videos of myself. You know, I did an introduction one when I kind of when I first went full time um, back in January, February and kind of stuck that on my Facebook page. And, you know, you know just from that video alone, I've managed to get a couple of clients because, um, again, just kind of skipping around a bit. I, I always tend to say, look, how did you find out about me? You know, how do you know about me? And somebody said, oh, it was through your introduction video, which was a, I don't know, like a 30 second video just to say, hi, I'm Neil. I do accountancy. Bye. <laughs> it was pretty much like that. It wasn't anything more kind of dramatic. Um, but I guess, I guess in terms of the early video content, it, it was just like that. You know, I've got one playing the guitar. Um, I've got one sort of walking around. Um, you know, I did one that says, oh, I'm off to get my hair cut because my barber's a client and we're going to discuss some business whilst we're there. What was I get my hair cut? And just kind of, I don't know, just sort of random things like that, really. Um, I mean, it wasn't until uh, I think it was around April, May, um, where I was interviewed by a couple of local business owners on Facebook Live. And it kind of got me thinking that, you know, I, I was quite happy doing interviews for them. And they kind of asked me bits and pieces about where I've come from and what I'm doing. And I thought, well, why don't we kind of ramp this up a little bit and, and, and give it some steroids and, and let's, let's have a group of people. Um, I'll facilitate it because no one else was doing anything like that, certainly locally. Um, and I said, right, well, I'm quite fortunate to know quite a few local business owners let's get them on a group zoom uh, a, a group zoom chat let's get a series of questions about the world and about the relief schemes and about just business in general not necessarily accountancy related some of them were some of them weren't um and let, let's have it as like a, a bit of a round table experience like you know i know teresa's doing at the moment for you mark and um again it was just kind of saying look you know i'm i'm doing this round table q a session here are the people on it that they're all sort of business owners, um, you know, and we're just going to be talking about some sort of salient topics. And I think, I, yeah, I think I did my first one in May. Um, I've done seven so far, I've done about one a month. Um, and I'm getting people asking me now to come on it and, and to kind of say, look, you know, I've seen these, I really want to be a part of it for the future. You know, cynically, it's a bit of a marketing ploy because it opens up people to other businesses and, it's helped create some strategic partnerships for me in other areas, which has been really, really good for my business and my clients specifically. Um, but it, it was nothing more than just saying, look, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to give all this help and advice through my social media channels and, you know, this is it, but in video format, really. Um, you know, I, I still do the odd selfie video every now and then. Um, but yeah, those, those webinar sessions have been, have been really powerful. And again, cross posting, you know, putting them across my social media pages, putting them on the Facebook group. Um, you know, this has led to, led to quite a, quite a bit of traffic really. And then certainly more than I could have ever have expected. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I see common themes coming across here and, I, and, and kind of two, two learning points I take away from from what you've said is it is number one you've been doing selfie videos people think you have to be really everything has to be perfect your your lighting has to be right the, everything's gonna be perfect for video uh no it doesn't when you're starting out no one expects to be perfect but i think even more important which is the recurring theme is it's all about getting out your personality people get to see who neil criddle is uh, when you do those those videos and so on which i think is is absolutely awesome yeah, I mean, people have asked, why don't, you, why don't you put a green screen behind where I'm here and project your business logo onto it and, and make yourself look a bit more professional? And my argument is, well, half the time people go, oh, you know, what's what's that model in the corner? What's that poster of? Or what's that graphic novel all the way back there? And it, and it creates an icebreaker and it, and it creates a, a, an entry point into a conversation. It doesn't matter if it's with a partner or whether it's with an associate or a client or a lead or, or whatever else it, it's it's a normally really good sort of first five minutes and then we talk about music we talk about you know our common interests and then oh we're talking about you know a, a potential client here so let's talk about what you need and what you want and it it just starts things off on the right foot and again would i want a, a green screen with my logo okay well 
it might make me look a bit more professional in terms of my industry, but it would take away, you know, a majority of the aspect, which I really pride myself on. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Okay, so on this kind of theme of the social media stuff and, and so on, uh, I'd love to know a bit more about uh, in the last, you know, how's your market, what is your marketing strategy, how are you growing it on social media? But let's start with Kathy's two questions because I came in early and they're, they're probably quick ones, but the first one, I'll, I'll give you both. She, she asked, how many members do you have now in your Facebook group? And the second question is, do you use software to post across different types of social media? Um. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I did statistics for a degree. So I, I'm a numbers man in terms of getting getting the stats up. So my, my my Facebook business page is currently on 997 likes, which is quite OCD for me. I'm desperate to get to that thousand just to just to say that I've got there. Um, I think on Instagram, I'm on about 980 followers. Um, and then the Facebook group's about 720 or something uh, members in there. And, but like I said, you know, two weeks ago, that was more like 600. So every time I, I, I do a cross post or, you know, I, I kind of advertise the group, you know, that those members increase quite, quite considerably. Um, so yeah, about, about 720 ish at the moment. And in terms of software, I, I, I don't use any, um, you know, I, I, but most of my pictures I post between Instagram and Facebook and there's a little flag that you can tick on Instagram that posts it to Facebook automatically. Um, and then it's a good old fashioned copy and paste onto LinkedIn. If, if I feel that that content is applicable for, for my LinkedIn crowd. Um, and it's, it's nothing, nothing more than that. You know, I probably post once every other day, maybe across the formats and it can, can take five or 10 minutes to create a post. You know, a lot of people say, Oh, where'd you find the time to do that? But it's really, it, it's really not that time intensive. The, the, the thing that takes the time is to think about, right, well, what should I be posting about or what would I like to post about whether it's a new client announcement or whether it's some content that I'm trying to market or whether it's my Facebook group, or whether it's a picture of a dog, you know, there's always quite a lot of ideas that are floating around in my head. So the actual time spent posting, it isn't, it's not a lot at all really. And you, and you block out Mondays, marketing Mondays, uh, for, for doing exactly that sort of stuff, I guess. How, how much, when you spend a, mon, a, a Monday focus on marketing, how much, what proportion of, of that Monday is, is, is focused on social media and what other types of marketing do you do? Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't particularly, uh, I don't particularly kind of segment what I do and, and kind of figure out how long I take doing, doing each piece. Um, I mean, I guess social media is a bit more dynamic in the fact that, you know, I could, I could set aside half an hour to think about some content for the week. Um, you know, I don't schedule any posts either. So, so I do everything live, which, you know, people are probably telling me to schedule stuff. So it takes less time, but, um, I don't at the moment. Um, you know, it could be, you know, if I've just, just eaten a curry and the wife's watching some rubbish on TV and you know, that I don't like, I'll, I'll, I'll get out the phone and I'll, I'll do a little social media post then. It's, it's just re really whenever I have a, a, a pocket of time. Um, I guess in terms of more of a strategy on, on Mondays, um, you know, the, the last couple of months have been a bit tricky because I've, I've been so busy. So, so Mondays have, have been primarily sort of more half a day really in terms of marketing. But um, I, I'm just going through uh, practice ignition and center integration. So I'm, I'm getting my service libraries aligned to automate when somebody accepts a proposal, it kicks off all the workflow and all the jobs in center that's something i'm doing manually at the moment so i'm, I'm mapping that all together um what else am i doing right now um i'm writing a couple of ebooks at the moment um which have been really sat in word format for the last month or two and i i, I kind of I, i've geared myself up to kind of made they make those a little bit more formal now that the facebook group is increasing so that i can market those in there um that's kind of about it really um other than just getting client, you know, asking for referrals from clients, asking for referrals from, um, from friends and family, you know, I've just sponsored my local football team that I, that I coincidentally play for as well. You know, there, there were 40 people at training last night and, you know, just hand out your business cards You know, ask if anybody wants an accountant, um, just let them know what you do, let them know what you can provide. Um, and then follow them at football and probably never get them as a client. <laughs> Yeah. 
I, I was I'm a bit gobsmacked actually when you said the size of your Facebook group, given that it, it's still early days. You're up to up to to seven hundred, which is is quite extraordinary. I know that there's in the Value Price Academy. I, I taught a session. I think it was if I remember right about fifteen months ago on why you need to build your own Facebook group, uh, and still people really struggle with that. But you've done an ex extraordinary job to get to those those numbers in such a, a short space of time. I know Kathy's asked another question. How often do you post on Facebook? Yeah, it's probably probably once every other day. I mean, you know, some days there might be two or three things I want to talk about and I'll, I'll post those all in one day. Um, yeah, yesterday, for example, I'd not posted any new client announcements for a few weeks. So... I did about five or six posts just to showcase the, the sorts of people that I'm working with recently. Um, but yeah, typically maybe, maybe once a day, once every other day on average. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've, I've kind of just noticed Neil, there's actually a lot more questions than I thought in the, in, in the chat box. So it, it might be, if it's okay with you, get a bit more random now and scattergun with yeah, some sure, of the questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, Cause Marcel asked a question about 20, 15 minutes ago. Uh, which I think was when you were talking about your your journey with the the Value Pricing Academy. He said, Marcel said, uh, information on the on the Value Pricing Academy and and from Mark is is so rich. Thank you, Marcel, and overwhelming. Uh, yes, there is a lot of content. Uh, he says. So the questions: What did you concentrate on first to get fast results? Um, I think there's the strategy around proposals and about offering choices and about making sure that your your lowest package is the one that you'd be comfortable with. Um, I think it, it, kind of knowing knowing that I wanted to do this full time, knowing that I had bills to pay, I, I had to make sure that I got that absolutely right. Or certainly that was my priority to kind of learn that that strategy first before thinking about anything else. I mean, you know, the, the strategy around social media and about you know, getting involved with Facebook networking groups, that was natural to me. That that was something that I'd, I'd already been doing. Um, I, I don't find it difficult. Like I said, I've got lots of ideas and lots to talk about. So the, the main thing for me with your program, Mark, was was to think about the, the choices that I was offering to, to my clients, getting my brochures sorted. So in terms of how I structure my business, I've got four key services. Um, that's bookkeeping, payroll, annual accounts, and business advisory. Um, so kind of understanding what goes in each service, understanding the tiers within that service um, and, and getting those into some sort of a brochure format. That, that, that was that was really key for me. Um, and, you know, everything else, really, I've just kind of learned on the flyers I've gone along. Um, but but certainly that that was that was priority for me. That was key. OK, I and mean, you've now answered Valerie's question. She wants to know if you do bookkeeping or do your clients do that? But you've answered that. That's one of your four services. Um, Ritesh uh, asked a question when you were talking about technology and, 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 and centering specific, specifically. So Ritesh's question was, do you do your, this is to do with center, do you do your end-to-end -end process in center, i.e. from client onboarding to all the client communication, exchanging all the client documents and delivery of work, etc.? cetera? Um, yes, to a degree. Um, so... Um, and, and actually I, I had a, a meeting this morning with, um, my, my practice ignition account manager. And with, like I said before, we're looking at uh, mapping these workflows into center and automating that through Zapier. Um, so at the moment things are a little bit fragmented in terms of how, how they're sort of linked together. But yes, I've got a, I've got a, an onboarding process that I do through center where they, they go from becoming a lead to a client and then I've got associated email triggers and, and sort of forms and paperwork that, that I need from them to, to sign them up fully. Um, and then in, t in terms of workflow, that all gets done through center. All, all of my deadlines are, are directed to me through center. Um, in terms of client sign off, um, I use zero tax, which is the tax product from zero. Um, so all of my annual accounts and corporation tax returns are, are signed off through zero tax. Um, anything like partnership or personal tax returns are done in the same way, but they're signed off through center. So I know zero tax are, are ramping up to do self-assessments in the future. And at that point, then I use that for, for doing those. But uh, essentially it's a bit of a dual approach for, for client sign off at the moment, but pretty much centers my, my kind of my Bible kind of from start to finish. And um, because it's so bespoke, because you can customize it so much um, there's not a lot that, that you can't do. Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm still scratching the surface in terms of what I can do. And there's so much more to automate. There's so much more time that I can, I can claw back. And I think that's, for me, that's the exciting thing about it. 
Yeah, awesome. Uh, okay, next question is from Brian Wright. He says, uh, are you seeing clients on Zoom? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, b between kind of the end of March and I would say end of July, um, didn't really leave the house. Um, you know, I was getting exercise and stuff, but my, my wife was kind of the designated shopper. So um, I, st I just stayed at home. Um, so I wasn't seeing anyone face to face. Um, meetings were being done on Zoom. And actually it was really good because a, a few clients I'd had even prior to lockdown, you know, that I was speaking to that weren't local. So we were, we were chatting on the phone. Um, and because I was using Zoom for kind of new leads and new clients, we then, I, I then started to, to divert that, that communication with those existing clients onto Zoom as well. So then I was, I was kind of looking at my existing clients for the first time that, that weren't locally based as well. So, you know, that, that, was, that was one of the benefits, um, I, I guess, of lockdown, if you know, if there were any. Um, but yeah, towards the end of July is when I started getting out and, and I was, I was seeing new clients for the first time. I've been working with some of these clients for four or five months and it was the first time that I'd, I'd actually seen them. So, um, you know, some I've still not seen, uh, A, because of time, B, because of geography, if they're not local and, and C, you know, some are still shielding and some are still at risk. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a bit of a funny experience at the moment. Um, uh, you know, and obviously with, with winter and the flu season, you know, we might go down a path where th there's another tranche of, of new clients that I hopefully on board that I, I won't see until well into next year. But um, Zoom has been great from that, that point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and, and so currently we still have obviously issues with the pandemic and, and uh uh, in the UK right now, times aren't great, but let's imagine that's all behind us. Uh, to what extent do you see going forward you conducting business online using technology uh, versus face to face? And also, I get the sense from what you said is that at the moment it's very much you're in um, Western Supermare and you're a very local firm. Do you intend to be focused on local? Do you do you intend to perhaps change and, and become more uh, wider geographic I, i'm just curious what we, what do you see the future yeah I, I mean i mentioned before i had a few early clients through um that bidvine platform that i was a part of for a couple of months and um you know I've, I've had referrals from those those people so um you know that's kind of blossomed my my client base in areas like london nottingham um sort of north wales midlands so my clients, albeit predominantly around Western and Bristol in, in the local area, um, it's, it's probably about maybe 60% of my client base are local, but 40% are, are throughout the country. Um, and again, you know, like I said about the Facebook group, I, I only ever intended it to be a local resource because you know, who would want to care about it, you know, um, outside of the local community. But, you know, the more people that have come in from other areas of the UK, you know, some have come from the continent and even like the States. Um, and you know, I've been getting queries and leads from, from those sorts of areas as well. So, um, I've got no limit on, on where I conduct my work. You know, I think we all know that our industry is, is, is pretty digitized right now and it's only going one way. Um, and actually if I can produce a really good, valuable service via a video conferencing facility, um, an email, then that's far more powerful and valuable than somebody that can sit next to your face to face but perhaps can't give you that value um so yeah n no limits in terms of where i see myself going forwards it, it's it's more about working with the right sort of people and kind of you know i'm still i'm still trying to find out my ideal client um for me it's predominantly based on personality right now um but the, the more people that i like the look and sound of that want to work with me that have that similar sort of entrepreneurial flair that want to grow their business that want to understand the the facets of what makes their business up um that's 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 what gets me excited i don't care where they're from no that, that's who i want to work with okay uh, and that kind of leads i think nicely into the, the uh, and partly answers the the next couple of questions that uh, that are on the list uh, which are uh, I'll, I'll, they're both related, so I'll ask them both at the same time. So Brian Wright said, "Do you have a, a niche clients?" And and Elizabeth said, "Do you have a niche you prefer to work with, or, or are you more of a generalist?" And if you're a generalist, do you intend to continue down that path, or have you got plans to 
to consider specialising? Yeah, so um, I guess in the early days, yes, of course, I was I was a generalist just to sort of get those client numbers up, get that retained income up, um, and 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 kind of that that's been my bread and butter, and that's what I've I've, I've really kind of been appreciative of. Now that I've got that in place uh, and I've got quite a good solid client base, um, to date I've got about 65 clients. Um, and like I said, I had about five at Christmas. So I've got those, those additional 60 since January. Um, I'd probably say two thirds of those uh, pay me on a retained monthly basis for services. So it, it's, it's given me that monthly kind of cushion to explore maybe niching and, and kind of thinking about what I want to do sort of longer term. Um, I, I come from a veterinary background predominantly, so I spent five years as head of commercial finance for the biggest veterinary group in Europe, um, and I was involved in quite a lot of merger and acquisition type activity for that group. You know, the, the kind of the, the model was to essentially buy independent veterinary practices and, and, and brand them effectively. So um, I've been very fortunate over the last uh, three or four months. Um, to have been approached by uh, a couple of investment groups. They're looking to do a slightly similar model, but on a smaller scale, they had that position at that veterinary group and they've asked, would I be interested to to do some advisory work for them as a as a non-exec director? Um, of which I've said, absolutely. You know, that, that kind of div- diversifies my portfolio and it, it gives me something slightly different to work on, um, which has been really, really good. And you know, that, that comes with its own joys because I've now got the compliance work for those projects going forwards as well. So I've kind of sort of fallen on my feet a little bit with looking to niche specifically within veterinary, but, but more so within mergers and acquisitions because there have, been a, there have been a couple of other projects recently that have been in different industries, but a very, very kind of similar sort of build and build, uh, buy and build type models. Um, you know, people looking to take advantage of the current situation, people looking maybe to retire and sell their businesses. And, uh, you know, these investment groups are looking to, to pick up some good, some good golden nuggets. So that's, yeah, it, it, in terms of niching, maybe, maybe mergers and acquisitions is something that I could niche towards. And, and specifically at the moment, veterinary is, is, is what I'm focused on. Um, it's a great industry. Um, and, you know, people aren't spending money on holidays at the moment. They're spending money on pets and on home improvement. So it's an industry that's doing pretty well. Um, wh- whether I continue to niche on that going forward, um, I don't know. Um, it's been nine months since I started. So um, I'm kind of just just seeing it, seeing what works and you know, making sure that I enjoy it, making sure that I'm delivering value. Um, and, you know, if, if, if I'm earning money, then that's just an added bonus for me. And that, I think, needs to be borne in mind that you've only been doing this for nine months. And in, in nine months, you've grown from, I think you said, from five clients you had to, to 65. We talked about pricing earlier, and you're, you're getting better at pricing all the time, bigger, bigger fees. You've grown your Facebook group to, to in the 700s. Uh, if, if, if Think about where you are today. If someone said to you back in January, on January the 14th, when you were made redundant, if someone said this is where you could be in nine months' time, what what would your thoughts have been back then? Um, oh, I honestly don't know. I, I I genuinely don't know. Like I said, I've never worked in practice before. I've never I've never experienced you know kind of tax return season and and all the other sort of things that happen when you work in practice. I've never really dealt with clients that don't pay I've never dealt with clients that don't give you information on time so all of that sort of stuff I I just really had no clue uh, and no idea and what what I did know is that I wanted to I was passionate about helping people um, understand their numbers and understand their business Um, and yeah kind of thinking back you know i I. And that 14th of January was was horrendous because yeah you know, I, I literally got called into the the chief exec's office at three o'clock and half past three I, I was out with my belongings and it was it was that kind of that sort of cut through and it was it was the third time I've been made redundant in the last ten years as well uh, which I'll add um, which you know I'm sure people have gone through you know the recession of ten years ago and, and have had difficult times but I kind of selfishly I was thinking oh is it just me you know is it something that I'm doing that's wrong. And uh, yeah, I left the office and went 
went to uh, went to the uh, the Weatherspoons pub um, by Bristol train station for a pint and just to sort of collect my thoughts and thought, well, what exactly do I want to do? You know, where do I want to be in a year's time? Do I do I want to go back in the job market and and kind of you know work that corporate lifestyle with that three hour commute a day, not seeing the kids, not doing the school runs, you know, working sort of seven till seven on a good day. Um, and I thought, no, I, I, I don't want that. I, I thought that I wasn't providing the value, that it wasn't being respected. And um, that, that's when I made the decision, you know, the, the following day, just to, just to start, just to see where it went. Um, you know, I've been, I mentioned before about strategic partnerships, but I've been very fortunate early on to get to grips with some uh, industry professionals. Like, you know, I've got a web developer that uh, we, refer, we refer a lot of work to each other who I get along with really, really well. Um, the same, my graphic designer who I've used for, for quite a while, I used to go to school with. Um, and again, we cross-refer. You know, my independent financial advisor as well is a good friend. Um, and it was just about creating that network of people, selfishly to get referrals from, but also to kind of bounce ideas out of and just to say, look, what am I doing? How do I do this? You know, you, you've been business owners for a while. You know, what, how have you done this? You know, what have you done? N no one in the accountancy industry, you know, I didn't know anyone else. It, it was just through their own respective industries and their own learnings. Um, so if you told me nine months ago, you know, would I be in this position now? I'm waffling. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had a clue where, you know, the kind of the journey that I've been on. But I think the most exciting thing for me is that there's so much more to do. You know, these bigger projects are long term things that could be very, very advantageous for me to get involved with. And, you know, I'm looking at potentially hiring next year in terms of people to help me out. And I, I just wouldn't have had a clue, no clue whatsoever. But, I, you know, the main thing is I'm enjoying it. It's providing a, an income for my family and I'm seeing the kids more. You know, I'm doing school runs. I'm doing all of that sort of daddy stuff that I should have been doing a long, long time ago. Yeah, it's such an inspiring story. And um, I mean, because you've, it's been a tough year for you I mean, to be made redundant, to get started with a brand new business and then COVID comes along and lockdown and so on. And I know a lot of other, a lot of businesses would kind of go into denial and, uh, and, and just get depressed about it. And, and you, I think you've been really positive and you've, you've, uh, you really, uh, it's, oh, is it, is it, it makes me wonder what you could achieve next year if, when, when, when we get back to some sort of normality. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think the thing for me is I had no choice. You know, I I, I have to feed my family, and uh, you know, I mean, if it didn't, I, I wouldn't want to think if it didn't take off because you know, the, the two months of cash would have taken me up to the end of March, and then and then I would have had no business, no job, and, and lockdown, and no money. Um, so I don't want to think about that. But um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm you know, people keep asking me like, you know, how do you feel and you know, um, what, what's your secret? And I, I just don't have any answers. I'm just being myself and, you know, it's, it's working. So I'm just going to continue to be myself. Yeah. Like, well, that's a great thing to do. Uh, right, a couple more questions, but actually what I'd, what I'd like people to do who have been, who have been listening, uh, is cause we're coming up to the, we're coming towards the end soon in the next 10 minutes or so we'll wrap up. Uh, but stick in the chat box. What's the one thing that's, that's been the most impactful for you from what you've heard of Neil's story? Stick it in the chat box because I would love to see it. I'm sure Neil would love the feedback as well. So put in the chat box, what's the thing that you've heard that's been the most impactful for you? Please do that. And then I'll share, we'll share the chat box with Neil so he can, he can see what you say. Please do that. Okay, a couple more questions. So I think Debbie and, and Elizabeth have asked similar questions, which I think you've part answered. So uh, Debbie asked, do you do everything yourself or do you use contractors or employees? And Elizabeth said, are you considering hiring employees or, or subtract, subtract, subcontractors? Uh, you've sort of answered it, but just to get clarity, I mean, you've grown incredibly fast. Is it right that currently now you do everything yourself or do you uh, outsource yep. some of it? Yeah, it's all me. It's all 100% me. Yeah, I've, I've never used... I've never used anybody to help me with bookkeeping or tax returns or anything. It's, it's been solely me um, from day one. I, I, and, to, and to be fair, you know, I've said that I'm looking at hiring, but realistically, that's probably not going to happen until early next year. So um, it's, yeah, I, I, it's a selfish aspect of me because it's, it's my name, my business, my brand. And I, I guess the kind of the delegation fear and, you know, somebody's standards might not be as good as yours and kind of all that, 
that those sorts of feelings you have when you take on your first hire mark, which I'm pretty sure that, you know, you probably went through when you were in, in practice and, you know, I'm feeling those right now. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's that leap that I, I definitely need to take, but up to now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just me. Okay. Well, it's amazing what you're achieving on, on your own. Um, and it is a big decision. It's a bit, I, I think the mistake I made back in, in 96 is I, I, I hired too easily because I was, uh, I was just obsessed, obsessed with growth. Um, I just wanted to grow a big accounting firm. And I thought the answer to that was to take on every, but anybody's a client, everybody's a client and then keep hiring people to do the work. And, and that causes all sorts of problems. And if I could, if I could turn the clock back to 96, which obviously I can't do, uh, I, I would have tried to resist hiring somebody for as long as possible. And I, and I love your attitude around, just using technology, invest in the best technology, put the systems in place, put the processes in place. Let's uh, see what other questions we've got. Um, ben said, do, you, do your clients generally have an accountant or tax advisor in addition to engaging you, or do you do the, do you do the year end financial statements? No, I, I, I do everything um, for all of my clients, apart from one who's a charity who has a, a separate accountancy firm that they probably have for about 20 years. But um, all of my other clients I do, well, I mean, some clients do their own bookkeeping, which is you know absolutely fine, but um, I, I don't work alongside another accountancy practice um, with my clients apart from that one charity. So, so everyone else works solely with me. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got a few more questions. Um, Shelley Johnson, going back to your social media stuff and, and posting and Facebook and whatever, um, says, put it, do you put different content on your Facebook page versus in your group? No, no, it, it's the same. And, and somebody's asked me a similar question about whether you put different content on LinkedIn as opposed to Facebook, because I know that the different, you know, demographics can be slightly different. But I, I thought about that and I thought about maybe making it kind of a bit more formal on LinkedIn. But then when I came to think about it, I thought, well, the, the, the range of content that I produce, you know, is equally formal and informal. And so therefore it kind of tends itself quite well to, to all three platforms that I use um and um yeah that that's kind of the, the strategy that i've used and, and really to be a nuisance um and to kind of get get known with with people you know like yourself mark you know i've i've shared private messages with people like shane lucas from avn um and reza uh, as well you know i, I had a one-to-one -one call with carl reader last month which was amazing you know such an inspiration and that was amazing um, I've got another call next week with a guy called Dave Selleck, who's doing some really, really interesting stuff at the moment with the Elgato Stream Deck, if you've heard of that. Um, so he's doing some really amazing things. Um, and, you know, things, you know, things like this, things like you, Mark, contacting little old me and Western Supermare, you know, it's just, it's just, a, it's just been quite, quite sort of amazing, really, to be honest. Um, and, you know, getting interviewed by other business owners, you know, I did a radio stint last week. Um, you know, I'm in the newspaper as well, the local newspaper. Uh, when I sponsored the football team so yeah, yeah just just things like that it just, just seems to have snowballed really but I've just been consistent in my approach I've not done anything different I've just been me um and you know that I, I think that that's the thing to take away in terms of social media and and networking and uh, and everything else you know you get found out I think if you try and be someone that you're not so just be yourself and you know the the, the traffic and the numbers you know it, it, it will all follow yeah. What would so with social media in mind? What if you were to list the top? What to you are the top three social media platforms? Um, so I use Instagram, Facebook, and, and LinkedIn as my my kind of my core three. I, I've got a Twitter account which I do update every now and then, but I don't necessarily get any sort of traction from that. And to be to be perfectly honest, I don't get much traction from Instagram either. Um, I think for the first sort of six months of my business, Facebook was was the, the the kind of strategy that I was using because I, I wanted to target smaller businesses, more compliance-based work and getting involved in the networking groups in my local area. You know, Facebook was just absolutely abundant with those sorts of people. Um, you know, th that was the first sort of four to six months. And then kind of the last sort of three or four months, I've focused more towards LinkedIn. Um, you know, like I said about getting that, that Zoom call with Car Reader, you know, that wouldn't have been possible for me if I hadn't of kind of focus more towards LinkedIn and I'd probably say 75% of my work in the last three months have, have come from leads generated through LinkedIn, whether that be, you know, larger businesses, 
whether that be more advisory based work, not compliance work and, and you know, projects as well. So um, I've definitely seen a shift from, from Facebook to LinkedIn. So those would be my two sort of my main kind of lead generating platforms. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, a quick question for you while you're on question, a Facebook group, Ritesh asked, is it a, is it a closed Facebook group or is it open? No. No, and, and like I said, with the Facebook group and the webinars that I run, um, you know, I've noticed over the last few months, you know, being in your academy, Mark, I've been getting friend requests from other members of the academy, and that's great. You know, I'd, I'd fully encourage, you know, we're not a competitive industry, or certainly I haven't found us to be one. It's, it's much more collaborative than I perhaps thought when I first started out, and, you know, people are only too willing to to help each other out in this industry. So, yeah, send friend requests, you know, the, the group's open. Um, and you know the webinars are, are open to whoever wants to view them. It's yeah, it, it's a resource for everyone. One of the things that that is great about you, Neil, is that you are so, so generous with your uh, advice and your time. You contribute so much in in our Facebook group. I really appreciate that. So this might be the last. Well, no, it won't be the last. I've got one final question just to wrap up. But uh, oh, another one's now come in. <laughs> so. Um, the question, one of the questions, I don't know who the question's from, but someone says, and I, you don't have to give uh, numbers if you're not comfortable, so please don't if you're not comfortable. But someone says, what is the average fee, question mark, do you off, uh, and, then, and then do you offer the menu price options to all prospects? Um, yeah, so I, I guess, um, yeah, kind of put me on the spot, really. I, I guess the first three to six months, my average fee was about, £150 a month for a retained client um, and obviously you know I would have some that were less than that if they were kind of smaller sole traders and you know I had some that were sort of four or five hundred pound a month for, for larger businesses so around £150 a month was my was my average that's increased quite a lot in the last few months it's probably more like £200 a month now in terms of an average fee um, and that's like I said before that, that's more about raising my well, it's two things. It's kind of raising my, my base pricing and it's also working with larger, more sort of advantageous businesses as well. Um, I mean, in terms of, in terms of turnover, you know, the, the title was not to hundred K, you know, I, my, my first target was to feed the family. The next target was to earn what I was earning in my day job before I got made redundant. And then the, the third target, which was the one that I really put my finger in the air and just, plucked a number out the sky if somebody said what would you like to do for you know uh, you know an, an average run rate for a year and I, I just said 100k just because it was an easy number to choose you know never did I think in a million years that I could get there let alone get there in in the space of a year but 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 that's what's happened um and and so yeah but but in terms of my my average fees um you know, it, it is it is pretty much depending on on, on the services that, that people procure, but it has I've I've noti noticeably seen it increase in the last few months. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, Elizabeth says it's probably not a question for now, but she did say, "Will your social media links be in the recording and resources? Will Neil be comfortable for us to join him?" So I'm gonna if you're comfortable, Neil, to share any social media links or anything. Just email across to Sarah, uh, and we'll happily share them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll make this the last question because it is the last question, and then I'll ask my final question because I'm I want to be respectful of your time, uh, and we always finish inside the ninety minutes. Uh, so Valerie just says, "Do you think that you would have taken this route if you hadn't been made redundant?" Yeah, my my strategy was to uh, acquire as many clients as I could that could effectively make a switchover between what I was doing for, for a day job. So, so my initial plan was around summer 2020. Um, so I was, I was planning on just acquiring the odd client here and there, continue working my full-time day job and then get to a stage where I was like, right, that that's enough of a retained income that I could, that I could take and, and, and basically just leave the day job. Um, and like I said before, the, the threat of redundancy was impending. So I, I kind of knew it was, it was coming to a, a, a natural conclusion. Um, it just happened a lot, lot sooner than, <laughs> than kind of what I was expecting, what I was prepared for. Okay, awesome. So I, my final question, Neil, is, uh, and uh, I've learned so much already, but if you could share 
Think of all the things you've learned over the last nine months of, of this amazing journey you've been on, this amazing practice you've started. If you could share three key tips with the people watching, what would your three tips be? Um, be yourself. Uh, you know, I've said that quite a lot today, but um, I, I really do genuinely think that, you know, just be yourself. Um, you know, just let your personality come out in what you do. Um, you know, secondly, you know, a bit of a cliche, but, you know, be proactive. Just just make make people aware that you're here to help them. You know, don't rely on word of mouth or, or, or don't rely on people coming to view your website. You know, you know my website was, was critiqued by, by Stephen in one of your sessions, Mark, a few months ago. And I know it's shocking. It's going through a rebuild right now. Um, and you know, like the lead, uh, the, the, the lead magnets and the appointment generation system, all that stuff I've still got to do, you know, the, the, I've got a whole list of stuff I need to do on that website, but yeah, don't, don't, don't rely on, on social media kind of sort of just, just doing stuff for you. Yeah. You still, you still need to, to put the effort in and, and kind of get your thoughts out there. Um, that's two things. Uh, third thing is, yeah, if, if there's something to prioritize, then yeah, prioritize on your, on your proposals and your brochures. Um, Make sure that your services are you know, clear, concise, um, and and make sure you know. I, I was quite fortunate because I have my Facebook group, but try and try and listen to people and see what their problems are in terms of your local area, um, because you can bet your bottom dollar if if people are suffering like that locally, they're going to be suffering like that all over the country. So once you've got your model fixed and you, you know what you're offering in terms of services and brochures, then it's it's quite easy to then scale that outside of your local area. Wow. That's been, Neil, that's been awesome. I mean, thank you so much for, for being so generous and sharing so much great stuff. It's been, considering it's nine months, I think it's an amazing journey. And I'd love to think that perhaps a year from now we can, we can get together again and see what the next, next 12 months has in store, because I'm sure this isn't the last we'll hear from you. I think that uh, this is just the start of what's going to be an amazing journey. Yeah, th thanks for thanks for inviting me on again. Um, I'm, I'm st I, I was almost in the chat box saying, "Hi, I'm Neil from Western Sydney, UK. Hope you're well." And I realised that I'm I'm doing this. It's just yeah, surreal. So yeah, thank you very much. I I, I thoroughly thoroughly appreciate it. Wow, wasn't that amazing? Uh, so if you want to find out a bit more about some of the things that were talked about, that was a session done for the members of the Value Pricing Academy. It's my pricing academy. Neil joined that in the early days. Uh, of his of starting his firm as, as you know if you want to find out more about that we open up enrollments twice a year and so I'll put some links below this video if you want to find out more click on some of the links and I will let you know when we open up places for the Academy and hopefully at some point in the future I'll get the chance to help you with your accounting or bookkeeping firm bye for now